hear me? Right, so great crowd tonight. I hope you've all, man well, you lot have managed to find the new venue, for composed to our, our usual one. Um, but So it's great to see you all here. I hope you have a great time. Um, I'm just going to like hand over to Mehdi from the Telegraph engineering team just to sort of like give a general welcome from the Telegraph and also about the health and safety stuff and where the toilets are and all that kind of thing. So he'll just do that and then I'll come back and tell you a bit more about the night. Thanks, uh, thanks Perry. So welcome to the Telegraph, guys. If you think I'm going to talk about all the uh, safety stuff and where the toilets are. <coughs> yes, that's correct. This is exactly what I'm going to tell you where the toilets are. It's just on the left-hand side. Um, we, have, we haven't got any fire alarm planned, so if you hear fire alert, that probably is a real fire. So in that case, security <laughs> guys will very nicely escort you out, so just follow their guidance. Um, thank you uh, for having our host letting us host your event. Uh, their performance is personally very close to, to, to my heart, and this community has been going for almost... Um, nearly seven years now, uh, yep. and I still remember like doing the fourth or fifth talk, uh, which used to be on top of the pub. Uh, and I, I was getting quite nervous about it, and I thought, well, it can't be that bad, it's on top of the pub, and it's now going so strong, so well done, Perry, for, uh, con for you know, consistently continuing with this, so that's great work on this one. And also to uh, speaker Estelle, thank you uh, for coming here, so welcome again. Um, and uh, from my side, uh, my name is Mehdi. Uh, I work in the web team for Telegraph.co.uk. Uh, how many of you guys have actually used uh, Telegraph.co.uk of consumed contents? Raise your hand. Cool. That's quite a lot. So the, the site, the performance of the site, which used to be something like 17 seconds a year and a half ago, it's been improved significantly. And the team who did this work, they're, they're here. They're literally sitting right behind you guys. So, uh, um, yeah. No. <laughs> so, so feel free to talk to them. And for, for, for those of you guys uh, who haven't consumed uh, news content from Telegraph.co.uk, I will suggest please do. It's quite good. And on that note, thank you very much. And I'm going to pass to you. Back to me. Just back, for to a, just back, back, back to me for just for a bit. It's all right. You can, we'll do, I'll do it for lectern for now. Right. So I'm just going like, to kind of tell you about what's coming, kind of coming up next after tonight. Um, so obviously... Yeah, I'm going to ask for a, a, a little, little bit of calmness, not too much rowdiness in the crowd, because Estelle first messaged me at 3.48 this morning, right, as she was getting on her flight in San Francisco, only arriving in London at 3 p.m. this afternoon. So it's a pretty amazing job that she's st <laughs> still compass mentis to actually give this talk tonight. So I think well, it'll be a fantastic I talk that we'll have a bit... Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it'll be great. But what we've got kind of coming up next is on the uh, 7th of November, we'll be back at the FT for a talk by the FT. It's going to be uh, Ree Sevens, and he's going to give a talk about how they've kind of like built, built FT.com and the challenges that they faced about speeding up but without slowing down. Yeah, so it, it's there, there's some there's some like going to expose a few gotchas that they hit and things like that. So that's on December the uh, sorry November the seventh. So it's pretty soon. Um, like tickets for that are already up on the site. So if you want to come then and you haven't got one already, you're more than welcome to. And then our Christmas event uh, will be on December the fifth. Um, that's kind of going to be almost like an, a bit of an open mic type night. So although I will, if you've got like kind of little short talks, it can really be on anything. It doesn't have to be like particularly on web performance. But if it's if you think it's going to be something of, that's going to be of interest to our community just for like that that night, that'll be good. It's the same thing as we done last year. And as, as, as we always do in December, any money that we raise through the ticket in in December, that gets split between um, BBC Children in Need and also Crisis at Christmas. So come along and support that event because it is uh, everything we do there on that one is for good cause. As you know, London Web Perf is, is non-profit and we're kind of like, we're kind of putting that all in the bank for something else that we're doing that's kind of a few slides further on in this that you might have seen. Because next year we've actually just we've actually just launched a Delta V conference. That's going to be on the 10th, 11th of May, uh, 2018. It's going to be at the QE2 Centre over in Westminster. Um, so we're hoping this is going to be an, a really, really, really fantastic performance event. Um, we haven't had one in Europe now, really, for 
a couple of years, I'd say. The last, the last Velocity that actually had performance content in it to, to any extent was a good, good two, three years ago. So we're kind of bringing, bringing, trying, to, trying to put the band back together, right? And, uh, and, 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 and give, give our community some good stuff. So we've, it's already getting fantastic response. We're getting um, sponsors are interested in helping us with the event. We've had over 30, 30 submissions to our call for papers already. So if you've got a talk that you'd like to give, then please do like push it in. Um, the speaker lineup is uh, is kind of continually getting updated, and there'll be some more announcements um, this week on that. If they haven't gone out already today, I don't know whether I can't see Ruth or Daisy here to like see whether they whether they've done it yet. But um, you know, there's there's going to be a real, real stellar lineup of of speakers in our space. So don't miss out. Um, the tickets are cheaper right now than they will be in a few weeks time when we actually fully release the program so uh, just kind of like when have I ever let you down trust me it's gonna be great all right and on that note at the end of the talk tonight we'll probably finish just around about half, uh, half past eight gonna go back down into the, the sky lobby again where you where you were held before coming up here and there'll be some more drinks and, and, and food down there at that time. So have a great night. And at this point, I'll hand over to our, our speaker, Estelle, and she's going to talk about uh, speed perception and lighthouse. OK, so thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not actually going to use my phone. Oh, but, uh, will that go to this side? Right here. Ah, there you go. So I don't actually need this. You don't need that. There you go. Maybe I do. Uh, oh. Well, good enough. Screen, I can figure it out. I can, I can figure it out. Uh, I just have to mirror the screens. Give me a moment. And then, I think my browser crashed. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Now we can get started. Sorry about that. Um, Everything that can go wrong will. So the reason my cell phone is actually plugged in is because my converter died. I blew it the moment I got to the hotel when I had almost no power left on my, um, on my phone or my computer because everything that can go wrong will. So today we're going to talk about um, speed perception, um, which is measuring subjective uh, versus objective measurements. And um, then we're going to cover Lighthouse a little bit. So, uh, w the table of contents for the talk is a performance overview, and then I'm going to talk about speed index, which everyone here has heard of speed index, um, and then perceptual speed index. Who here has heard of uh, PSI? You don't follow me on Twitter. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the speed perception study, and then I'm going to go into Lighthouse. So, my name is Estelle. I'm an open web evangelist and a community um, engineer been doing front end for 17 years. My first performance talk uh, at Velocity was in 2011 on mobile, and it was on actually what happens in the device rather than input output because no one was covering that. And now Velocity doesn't cover that at all. And so I also have a conference. I'll cover that uh, later on. But go to the one here or go to the one in California, whichever one you'd rather go to. Or you can do both, both. Yeah, both yeah. Um, this book right here, uh, ebook came out yesterday. So uh, 10,088 pages if you have insomnia. Uh, wrote it with Eric Meyer. So first part, performance overview. What is performance, metrics, and perceived performance? So two seconds to load, is that fast? Yes, no. It depends. If it's a hello world, it's ridiculously slow. How about 18 seconds, slow or fast? 
Well, if you were downloading the trilogy of Lord of the Rings, that would be amazing, right? You could wait that long. Um, so it's really like, it depends. And this is the first audience that's ever said it depends. People have been like, two seconds, that's slow. And I'm like, and who here has a site that loads faster than two seconds? Almost no one. Um, so there's no such thing as load time anyway. Because when I said two seconds for Hello World, was that because you were running um, a Pentium 1? And that was your server? Uh, it's, it's a range. So there's not actually, you can't actually say that there's a load time. Or you can say it's a, it's a range, but there's no actual number. Because every time you test it, it depends on uh, your network, it depends on your device, and it depends on how much uh, traffic the, the user gets. So I'm going to ask you which one feels faster, and you're going to tell me the left or the right. OK, so you already made a decision, right? So the left, right? Well, the left hadn't actually finished loading, right? So people made a decision that this had loaded at the five second mark, but it had not finished loading. So all of the metrics that we use um, are measuring things, are measuring metrics, like time to load, visual complete, time to first byte. Um, performance is many things. It's time to load. It's time until the site is usable. It's whether it, there's jitter when you're scrolling or jitter in an animation. It's how responsive it is to your touch. It's also how responsive it is on that load because sometimes it loads and it's not interactive. Um, so in 2015, Google came up with Rail. Has everyone here heard of Rail? Yeah, pretty much, okay. Uh, I won't go too much. But it basically said for, for scrolling to be good, you need to um, have a, a frame rate of, um, of 60 frames per second. If you're not going to have a frame rate of 60 frames per second, you might want to do 30 frames per second, but you certainly don't want to do 7 frames per second, 60, 2, because that'll look bad. You want it to be consistent. Um, but 16 milliseconds per frame is the frame rate we want, actually 16 and 2 thirds. But that includes everything. That includes all of the JavaScript and um, the repaint. So if you're going to repaint the page, you have to have all your JavaScript done and all, um, everything done in less time than that. Uh, time to tell a user that you've received their input, 100 milliseconds. Uh, time for idle is 50 milliseconds, and what that means is, see I asked if everyone's heard of it, everyone's heard of it, I'm going to anyways. So, and then it says page load uh, should be under a second, and that is a goal, but almost no one um, gets to visually complete in, in one second. So web performance, the, the metrics that we're looking at, um, the things we consider are the number of downloads, how long um, it takes to parse and execute, um, and then what I actually find most important is the perceived performance, what the user thinks it takes, because that's the user experience. So at five seconds, you had all decided that that page had loaded, you knew which one was faster. But your metrics would have told you maybe that story or maybe a different story. The metric I chose to use, which was visually complete, showed the, the contrary. Um, so um, all of these right here, these are the things that we, uh, that we measure. Um, these are the things that we can measure. We can actually find the time for all of those. Um, and then if you see the colors, I actually put those colors out because if you look on a flame chart, that's the colors that are used. Um, so that is what we're looking at. And these are all objective measurements, right? They're all metrics that we can count. But none of them are subjective or what the user is actually feeling. So I'm just going to give you one more example. So these two have approximately the same load time, right? 3.7 seconds. But their visually complete is very, very different. The load time that we measured was 3.7 seconds. The visually complete, one takes twice as long as the other. Because one has jank, it has motion, it has a carousel. Don't put a carousel on your website. But, but had I asked originally which one loaded faster, 
some of them might have, some of you might have said at four seconds you would, could have determined because that shank doesn't bother you. Wow, that screen is tiny. Um, but I'm going to leave it that size uh, because I can't see it. Uh, because actually, well, let's try making it bigger. Nope. Okay. Um, so I could open it in a different page, but what I really want to show you is that these are the timelines, and just look how far it goes, right? It keeps going. So you have this, because so I'm going to be using Staples and Wolfermans throughout this example. And so above you have Staples and below you have Wolfermans, which were those two sites we just looked at. When we look at load, um, that's the way it looks like. If we actually were to tell our boss, our boss tells us make the site faster. So are we going to give them this result or are we going to give them this result? I could click on it, the one we had before, whatever. So you see how, depending on what I want to measure, visually complete, one's faster than the other. Time to load um, is the other way around. Okay, so what makes good user experience? Time to first bite. Here's another example of looking at things. This site, this is, this is total BS statistics, by the way. This tight site took seven seconds to load. This one took eight seconds to load. Which one loaded faster? What? Eight seconds. Right, if it, that, that one feels. This is a better user experience. So what um, we wanted to figure out is um, speed perception, what humans perceive to be fast. And these metrics, we don't know which one is actually best matches human perception. Um, and then this is, uh, I could open a new page, but basically, this is a dumb content loaded event. This website, um, it depends on you know how it says how long does it take to load. It depends what your network is. But a two second dumb content loaded event because you have 43 dependencies, it might feel like it downloaded fast, but if you can't interact with it because it's taking two extra seconds, not good. So the questions we were asking ourselves um, was, how do different things impact users' perceived perception? So one of them was like that jitter that I showed you um, with staples taking a long time to load, but did that really bother people or does it not bother people? Is it possible to predict the, um, you know, can we, is there a metric to, to actually me measure jitter? Um, okay, so I basically created a bunch of SVGs and apparently I had, um, and the font size is done in viewport widths. So no matter how, like my font size will never change because it, it's based on the viewport. So that's where I was going wrong. Okay, so I woke up and, and just realized that. So these are Wolfermans versus Staples statistics. Which one matters? Anyone know? I don't. Okay. So there's two metrics that I want to talk a little about, about, which are visual metrics. One is speed index, and the other one is perceptual speed index. And here, everyone said that they had heard about speed index. Um, it was, um, it's basically an above the full quality of experience um, metric, uh, I believe created by Patrick Meenan, and it is used in web page test. So this is Wolfermans and Staples again, and the way the speed index is measured is we basically count the blue or the pink. And those are the numbers. So it's basically what percentage of the page is not loaded at every single 100 milliseconds. That's the equation on the bottom. Does everyone understand that equation? Even if I didn't have jet lag, I would not be able to read that equation. Um, because calculus was, I'm not gonna tell you how many years ago, but some of you were not born when I took calculus. Um, so, the speed index is basically it's every frame, like every 100 milliseconds, they take a picture and it's basically how many of those pixels did um, have ch changed or did not have color. So let's say there's nothing for the first one second. This is the way I explain it because I can't explain that metric. So there's nothing shows for the first second. So that is a thousand because it's zero percent, it's 100% of the pixels are missing on the first uh, tenth of a second. 100% are missing on the second, so that's 100 plus 100 plus 100, so every tenth of the second. 
At one second, we get 50% of the page load. That means that 50% of the page is missing, or 50% of the pixels have nothing on them. Um, so 50% of the pixels that are fully drawn here were white at this point. And so every 100 milliseconds, it basically can get a maximum of 100 points. So here we got 1,000 points, here we got 500, here we got about 450. So at this point, we're already at 1,950. Um, and then here, we would get 40, 40, uh, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 28, 28. And that's the way it's added up. Does that make sense to people? I think it's easier than that equation. Um, and you don't really need to know exactly like how that equation is, but that's the general idea. The thing is, if you've decided right here that the page is loaded, does that really matter, the rest? And yet, speed index is still measuring that. Um, okay, so there's two ways to look at what's missing here. White, like nothing, versus a pixel of any color, right? So if the pixel is gray, and then the pixel turns purple, and then say the pixel turned green, during the load, it didn't count anymore. Once it was no longer white, um, it was counted. So there's pixel-wise similarity versus histogram difference. Basically, I'm going to explain what that means, because even without um, jet lag, it's basically saying that the first one, the speed index, the regular speed index, doesn't capture whether there is a shape change, a color change, or an object similarity. So if you take something and you drop it, um, there was still 50% of the page was painted, and then 50% of the page. So if you loaded the page originally, at one second it looked like this, and at two seconds it looked like that, your speed index from that one second to two seconds would be zero because 50% of the page is black. So all of these would produce zero. So a different way to look at that um, I can't really explain this slide, but it's really cool, so I'm going to let you do it. Um, take your finger. So if something switches color and you can't, like, speed index doesn't capture that. And this one, I think, is the best way of explaining it. So all of these have a mean histogram difference of approximately 144. This one's 142, right? This is the original image, so this is perfect. There's no um, difference. This is a really good rendition of this, right? The mean histogram difference is 144, but the structural similarity is almost 100%. Whereas this is the worst, and mean histogram difference is 142, um, whereas the similarity is only 66%. So basically, Speed index is measuring this one, and perceptual speed index measures that one. There's nothing wrong with speed index. I'm not critiquing speed index. It's just, if you have an image that drops, right? Like, you, lo you, you load a page, and then all of a sudden it drops. That is jitter. And speed index will not capture that. Perceptual speed index will capture that. Um, but does it matter? Like, you all thought that page had loaded before it started being jittery. So this is the, um, the speed index. It's the exact same thing. They're complementary. I'm not critiquing one. I'm, like, I'm not saying speed index is bad. They're totally complementary. Um, it's just two different ways of looking at it. So the only difference between this equation and the other one is one was via uh, mean histogram difference, and one is with structural similarity. And if you don't remember what it is, it says structural similarity. Okay. And just to prove that they're about the same, this is Etsy's website uh, from 2015. These are really old videos. But one of the best loading pages, no jank. Look how correlated they are, right? Um, when you have a little bit of jank, don't blame Ralph Lauren. This is from a site in 2015. Um, they might have improved. I don't know. But you have something showing up. So one of them doesn't capture it as much as the other one. They're actually really highly correlated. When I said they were correlated, this is um, 
PSI, SI, they're along the same line. Um, PSI is just basically pointing out when there's that jitter. When something drops down the page, one captures it, the other one doesn't. Um, and the reason we were looking at this is because we believe that it better matches human perception because the computer sees that the pixels are, you know, 50% gray, we're all good. Humans say, oh my God, that moved. Okay. Uh, so these are the comparisons for, for Staples versus Wolfermans. So speed index, primarily focused on the progress of above the fold loading, both of them are. One doesn't account for layout stability, the other one does, and they're complementary. And so here are a few resources. Uh, PSI and SI are open source on GitHub, and they're both in, um, uh, they're both in, this, in this repo. Uh, this is more details on uh, PSI in a long, long article. Um, there's two different tests. The reason I'm covering Lighthouse is because it has PSI, and also because I think it's a really cool tool. Um, but Speed Index is in a web page test. So if you're using Lighthouse, you're, the metric you're actually getting is PSI. Okay. So a lot of this is basically just to intro this study that we did called Speed Perception. Um, it was a study to, to see how users perceived um, load. So to read it, Speed Perception was a large-scale web performance uh, crowdsourced. So we actually got individuals to do this. Uh, Patrick Meenan put a little banner on web page test and we got tons and tons of people, literally over uh, 2,000. Okay. Um, and the premise was, okay, so the thing with it is it's really slow. Don't you love like when you do performance things and they don't load? I'm going to try loading in a different page. Uh, open a new tab, see if it loads at all. It is loading, okay, so it is loading. I stopped biting my nails, so I, now I can make that noise. Um, so it gave instructions, and it basically said click left if, one, if the left one's faster, click right if the right one's faster, um, click about the same if they're the same, click next to hit next. Um, but it did say watch the pair of videos showing two websites load. Um, they turn gray when they end and wait until they end. So this is, this is version two. Version one is no longer live. Um, there were some problems with, uh, we get demographics um, on number two, and we also uh, see how long it takes to click with number two. Um, but what number one did was just this part, which was you look at two videos, um, and these are mobile emulated, so it's actually supposed to take a long time because mobile takes a long time to load. Which one loaded faster? I'd go with left. And that, that's it. That's what speed perception is. You get a bunch of websites, videos of them loading, and you say which one loaded faster. And that's it. Okay. So we had three hypotheses. The first one was that visual metrics would, work, would correlate better to, to human perception than um, non-visual or network, network metrics. That makes sense, right? Um, no single metric would explain human choices with 90% or more accuracy. And the third one was that no one would wait until they were visually complete to make their choice, despite being told to wait till the video turned gray. And we all saw, we all made the decision that at 4.5 seconds or 5 seconds, we knew which one loaded. So we got 5,444 sessions. Um, there were honeypots, there were three honeypots, which were like three ones where it was obvious which one was faster. And if you um, didn't get two out of three right, it was obvious you weren't paying attention and we threw out your results. Um, we, also didn't throw, we also threw out results of anyone who didn't finish the whole thing. So in the end, 51% were complete and valid because they got the honeypots right and um, they finished. Um, and that meant we had a total of 77,000, almost, almost 77,500, of which 75% were valid. That is really good when you're doing statistics. It's amazingly good. And every single pair, this one's the lowest, got above 240 votes. So we had really good numbers. These are, it was 160 video pairs. Um, so we were sure, like we were confident that whatever, what the results uh, we got were accurate. 
Um, we also had a thing at the end which said, do you have any comments? And the comments were, um, because when we did the original study, it was really just videos and it was all, um, we only used retailer sites. So every single one of them basically had a pop-up. It was not new, it was not Alexa 1000, it wasn't the fastest sites, it was pop-up city, you know, please sign up for our email. Um, and so people told us it was interesting, but basically people said there's tons of pop-ups, like what the heck's going on with pop-ups? So we actually weren't studying pop-ups. Um, and I'm gonna start with hypothesis three, because it's easier to explain hypothesis one and two when you know what the answer to three is. So hypothesis three was that users will not wait till visually complete. So when did users decide that videos um, were loaded? We don't know exactly because we couldn't, we didn't know exactly how long it took someone to click, but we did measure how long it took. So we made a guesstimate as to, in, per individual, how long we thought it took them to click, which was basically how long it took them when it was the obvious one. Um, sometime between load time and visually complete is when people figured out that the site was loaded. These metrics on the bottom are in the order that they occur, but they're not in the order, like spatially they're not accurate. And that's actually why I spread out the image so it looks like crap. Um, it's kind of it's like, don't count on the distance, but realize that sometime between load time and visually complete, people have made that decision that it's loaded. So our first hypothesis was that visual metrics would perform better than non-visual metrics. And so for, I think you can see it, the ones that are striped are visual metrics. The ones that don't have stripes are um, network metrics. You might notice that uh, it's not true. Visual metrics did not perform better than network metrics, which made no sense to us, just like it makes no sense to you, right? Um, so we're like, okay, we're not measuring this right. So then we started thinking, well, those metrics weren't measuring jitter, right? How do you measure jitter? How do you measure the effects of a pop-up? And is the pop-up in the first place the issue? Um, and were the visual metrics measuring uh, the right things? Oh. Uh, okay, so that was his equation. This is, so I did this uh, Parvez Ahmed, who I used to work with, um, that was his, I, we were discussing it, and that was his whiteboard, and I'm like, I don't know how to write that in HTML. I actually do, but I'm too lazy. Um, so, let me just reload this right here. Please reload, please reload, please reload. Okay. Um, so he basically said, instead of measuring it from zero to visually complete, which is what PSI and SI were doing, what if we measure it from render or up until render? Like let's figure out different metrics because obviously speed index, all these things, like visual metrics should be, like the hypothesis should work. Um, so uh, instead of going all the way to the end, and ending it at time to click. So we did that. We um, looked at it. Uh, to page load time. And we got a correlation that was much higher. So back here, the highest was render at 65%. If we looked at PSI and SI from zero to page load time, it went up to 79 and 81% respectively. Because remember that original one when I said if you've decided 4.5 seconds that the page is loaded, why are we still counting perceptual speed, like why are we still calculating the PSI and SI? That's what this one shows. So um, we basically just played with all the numbers. Now the thing is, this was not part of our hypothesis, right? You can't just uh, do a study, say, I didn't get the results I wanted. So let me fudge, you know, some results. So this is what we're studying right now. We're basically saying, doing the study over again, and this is the hypothesis we have. Um, because, uh, did you, any of you uh, hear of the Harvard um, alcohol binge, or the college binge drinking study? Okay, so, um, 
I went to this, the School of Public Health, and it was going on when I was there, uh, that study, and they defined binge drinking as five drinks. So how many people were binge drinking in college? And it was like 50 or 75% of men and like 20% of women or 10% of women. So they changed the definition of binge drinking for women. And I called bullshit, right? Because you don't change the definition of what binge drinking is once you realize that not, women aren't binge drinking on campus. It's like, well, you said this is what binge drinking is, so binge drinking is, you know, women aren't binge drinking. Um, so this is the, kind of the same thing. We need to study this again. Um, but this was a really interesting finding. So now it is true. We do have a number. Um, these three are striped, right? They are better indicator than the non-visual metrics. Well, these are visual metrics, but these three. Okay, so our second hypothesis was no single metric can explain human choices with 90% accuracy. So if we look back at the original ones, I got rid of the striping now, 65% um, was the highest, so that was true. And still true when we fudged with, when we played with the numbers. So we were like, is there any number that we can play with to get a better result? Um, so we used machine learning to, f to play with all the results and see if we took any metrics, any combination of any metrics. And the reason we use machine learning is because doing the math without a computer would have been hellish. Um, and there it is. Let me make it smaller so you can see it. OK. Um, when we took a, a metric, these are the metrics we already talked about, right? Page flow time, these two right here. And then we did um, perceptual speed index and speed index on time to click. So time to click was not an exact measurement. It was basically the measurement of um, the honeypot. So we're not 100% sure. That is why the next study has that blue dot. So we can say, how long does it actually take for you to click? So we can actually see at what point click is. So if we take speed index, time to click, um, PSI, ending at a time to click, plus render, and a combination of those three metrics, we reached 87, point, uh, to 87, uh, 87 to 90% accuracy. So that is the most accurate um, correlation that we found. Yet, just like that alcohol binge drinking study, we can't just make up these definitions once we find numbers that match, so we need to test it. So the conclusions and thoughts on this was that there was no one unicorn metric, but there might be a combination metric. Um, and so in the second study, this is uh, information on the first study. Um, uh, I used to work at Instart Logic. Oh. And because I used to work there and I don't work there anymore, I have a ton of bracelets if you want them. Um, have me clean up my house. And also, I travel like with a suitcase full of these, and then I don't have them when I leave. Um, and then I have room for stuff that I can buy. Um, and when I went on a, a trip two weeks ago, they lost my suitcase. So I had to buy a suitcase, or I acquired a suitcase. I didn't really buy a suitcase, because I was in France, and I brought home a suitcase full of chocolate. Literally, I had, 20, uh, I had 12 and a half kilos of chocolate. <laughs> So if anyone wants this bracelet, it lights up when you move it. But what's really cool is um, if you turn it on and you talk to it, it lights up. <laughs> and some people think this is for kids. No, I wear these. Um, so if you want some, I have some. Anyway, so I used to work at Instart Logic with all these wonderful people. Um, uh, Parvez is still there, and he is working on uh, number two. So the phase one was um, finished a year ago, um, and phase two is going much slower. Um, but in phase two, we're looking at all of these metrics, and we have did all the learnings that we did, which was, one, it's not all e-retail. It is Alexa or 1000, so there are some that have no pop-ups, so we can see if that's different. Um, there's uh, modals versus non-modals and stuff like that, so we can really take a look at it. So, um, oh. I hope I brought it, because I don't want to bring these home. OK, so these are business cards. If you can take one or 10 and pass it around. Um, all it has is the, um, 
it has the website, so you can take this, because, uh, here. I'm a, an engineer with marketing skills. Really bad marketing skills, but marketing skills nonetheless. Um, so I made business cards. If you can take, the, if you can um, do the challenge, that would be awesome, so that we can finish uh, part two. So with all said and done, everything I've talked about today, there's one thing that I really want, um, it doesn't matter um, uh, what your metrics say in the end, or, or I mean it does, obviously, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, um, some of that stuff was really slow, like that, that Visa checkout, because they have 43 dependencies. So user experience is more important than developer experience. Say it after me. User experience <laughs> is more important than developer experience. So a lot of people think performance is, as an engineer, how long does it take us to develop something? That does not matter. What matters is how the user feels when they get all your, your data at the end. So don't use 200 frameworks if it's going to um, take all your time. So that said and done, let's go into Lighthouse. And uh, there's an unclosed element somewhere in my deck. So I had to, s the easiest way to fix the deck was just to cut in half and put the second half in a new deck um, so it lines up correctly. So I'm going to do a code example, talk about Lighthouse, and show um, some improvements. So the code example is this. Has anyone seen Zoolander? This is funny. Okay, so um, it's actually it's a machine learning workshop, and um, your instructors are Hal 9000 and Eve, and Hal has you know, and there's a little. Uh, this was an East. Uh, this was an April Fool's joke, um, so you can actually turn it off and turn it back on. And then if you go down, there's people who gave the reviews or machines that gave the reviews. So there is um, Blend and Smooth who used to be a margarita maker and now is an aspiring load balancer. There's Hoover Suckdeep, um, who was a former <laughs> sucker and now is an aspiring DDoS cop. And then there's Toasty McToastface. Um, he was formerly half-baked. And now I guess he wants to be Donald Trump. That is so scary. Um, but he was hacked, apparently, because uh, that happened. Um, so this was a joke I created for, um, for April Fools. So I didn't really care about the performance. But I thought, if I'm going to give a talk, I need a crappy site that I need to load to, to, to test. Um, so I decided to make a progressive web app, or at least improve it. So I decided to use Lighthouse. And Lighthouse tests whether it's a progressive web app, the features, whether you have them, performance, best practices, and accessibility. It did just, OK. So. It, I know that it's, the error is somewhere between these two slides because uh, that, that kind of gave. So um, Lighthouse, where do you find Lighthouse? Lighthouse is an extension for Google Chrome. You can NPM install and do it at the command line. But let's just, uh, I'm just going to do machine learning workshop. Let's see how fast it loads. That was awesome, right? That was under two seconds. Um, <laughs> That is on my server in Dallas. So that's pretty good. Um, but if I go in the Chrome DevTools and I go under audits, it is right there instead of the former audits. So I don't know if you guys know what the audits looked like before, but you could do all sorts of audits. Now it's just Lighthouse. And then it says, do you want to do test for progressive web app, performance, best practices, and accessibility. So that's where you find it. Um, but you can also do it at the command line. And I could just type, um, I could npm install it, and then just write Lighthouse, and then the URL I want to test. Uh, next slide. That's a beautiful slide. <laughs> so I assume that is my original um, view. So I'm going to um, just find it live original. OK, live original. I didn't give it a JSON file, the original. So the nice thing also is, if you go to googlechrome.github.io slash lighthouse slash viewer, you can actually, I'll show you in a second how to, how to save that. So um, I can actually uh, just open that file 
and there it is. So let me just show you how I did that. Uh, machine learning here. If I do run audit, it's going to run the audit. Um, it's auditing my web page. Did you see it opened it up in mobile? And it's slowed it down. And it's checking to see whether my um, page is wider than my screen. Um, it does it probably without JavaScript. I don't know what it does. But there's this little button right here. And that's how you can download it. So you can download it right here. And then you can save it and just add the extension that says JSON because it makes it much easier. So um, I'm going to do london.json uh, and save. And then when I go here into that viewer that I was telling you about, I can go right here and just open my London um, and open it right there. And there you have it. Thank you. OK. That was a curtsy. I'm in England. I'm supposed to curtsy, right? So I think that's what was on this page, but I don't know. If it wasn't, that was pretty good. So, oh, it was probably my accessibility results. So on um, the original, which was this, maybe, I was pretty damn close near accessible, right? Um, let's go look at accessibility. Um, color contrast is satisfactory. Accessibility is really important. So why am I covering Lighthouse? Because you think it has to do with performance? Because no matter what talk I give, I always give a talk on accessibility in the middle. And this is my talk on accessibility in the middle of my performance talk. So um, there were two things I had to fix. Um, and and uh, Lighthouse told me. Or it didn't tell me. It just said, check these things. Um, this is one thing I forget all the time. Uh, what language? Put the language in your HTML tag. And then check the contrast. So I got pretty much everything that they wanted in terms of accessibility, which I think is on this slide. Oh, no. It's, I just went back two slides, and there it appeared. Um, so these are some of the rules it has. Um, and these are what it will check for. Um, but it also gives you some guidance. So do make your page accessible. And here it says, um, like, add all this ARIA. Do you know what ARIA is? Accessible Rich Internet Applications? So the first rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA if there's a native HTML element that will do what you're looking to do. In other words, HTML is by default accessible. And as, def as developers, it's our job to not mess with that. So just use HTML and you will have an accessible website most of the time. OK, off of my high horse. So um, the color um, contrast issue that I had, is there enough contrast between this text and the darkest gray behind it? So I just made the white sheet behind it a little bit more opaque. And then there's another issue where it tells me that I'm wrong, um, that there isn't enough contrast between like this L if it lands right on top of that circle. But I, it is a larger font, and it does have a drop shadow. So um, Lighthouse made me think about it, and I determined that even though the accessibility contrast ratio of the text versus the background for, for a 12-pixel font is not enough, with the drop shadow and the fact that it's a large font, I think that's, that's actually legible. So um, accessibility, that's one of the things, is you have to use your brain. OK, so we missed a section here because I'm just going to reload and hope it works. OK. So then I tested best practices. And it told me that I had 16 insecure requests, that I wasn't using HTTP2, and that my manifest short name wasn't, um, uh, wasn't there. Well, those are really easy things to, to fix. Um, so I did. Um, oh, I put it into big font just in case you couldn't read it. Uh, cause, uh, so my main issue was I was not on HTTPS. I was on HTTP. So put everything on HTTPS. It's basically all the new features that are coming out in your browser require it. So if you want to do a progressive web app, if you want to do AMP, and you shouldn't, but you really should because if you're real news, please do, because all the fake news does it. Um, I wrote um, an article on how to, do, um, uh, how to use Let's Encrypt with cPanel. So if you're running your own server on cPanel, that's just an easy tutorial. OK. 
Then next, um, I did uh, performance. And these are some of the things it, um, that I need to look at. And how was my performance? My performance was 76. OK. I love the fact that, did you notice how all of these are just changing? There's some, there is an unclosed div somewhere, and apparently I did not catch it at the flight at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, so Lighthouse, this is metrics. Oh, this is metrics. First meaningful paint at 3.8 um, seconds. Um, you'll see that it's not loading very quickly. Uh, first interactive at 4.5. Perpetual, perpetual, uh, perceptual speed index. See that? Perceptual speed index. We got it in there. Um, at three point, uh, at, uh, at 3,200, but you want to get it under 1,250. So some of the things that I discovered that I could do is, one, I was making calls. I was making an external call to a font file, a Google font file. And when you basically say get the CSS file, the only thing that that ha anyone here use Google Fonts? Yeah, pretty most people. So when you make that request, all it does is send you back a little CSS file that's this long. Copy that, stick it in your CSS, and then you just reduce one HTTP request. Even with HTTP two, doing that is faster. Okay. Um, so I had these two fonts. So I got rid of Open Sans because I can't tell the difference between whatever I was using, Helvetica or whatever. I'm not a designer. Like, to me, this is a nice outfit. Like, a, you know. Um, wait, you're laughing, it's not. Um, so I got rid of one of the fonts. The other font, I took the little uh, at font for his call and I put it in my CSS. And then I took my CSS, which was 10.5 KB. Yeah, so less than 14 kilobytes. If it's less than 14 kilobytes, stick it right in the head, right? So I put it right in the file, in the head, and it's all good. Um, so these were things that I actually was doing correctly. Um, so this is what Lifehouse will tell you. It will tell you what you're doing correctly. And if I wasn't doing it correctly, it would give me suggestions. So whereas, do you remember why slow? Anyone here remember why slow? It's a pre okay, good. It's a precursor to page speed. Why slow was great. I used it about five times. I memorized it, and then I never used it again because um, it was annoying. But it did teach me what the rules were. This is, tool is just way more advanced, and they also keep updating it. So, um, so it gives you suggestions based on your actual content. It, I think it's a really good learning tool. So Lighthouse is not just to, to test. Um, so then uh, the fourth part was progressive web apps. And um, I don't know if you know this, but um, my site is a one-page thing that no one needs to download and save on their phone. And there's no reason to have a service worker, because what would I do with that service worker? So I was like, I can take some of their suggestions to make my app faster, but I'm certainly not going to add a JavaScript framework to make it a progressive web app in terms of having a service worker, because I don't need push notifications and I don't need geolocation, unless I'm just trying to be nosy and annoying. Did I just say that? I did. OK. Um, so some of the things it says, the site is served on HTTPS, which we just did in the, uh, best, in the standards one. Um, pages are responsive, which um, kind of also came up with best practices. Um, the start URL at least loads while offline. So for that, I need a manifest. Um, metadata is provided to add to the home creed that is in the header. And these are all easy things to do. Right? This is something you should do anyways, whether it's a progressive web app or not. Um, and each page has a URL. That's also a really good thing to do, whether it's a progressive web app or not. So I had 36% because um, I didn't have HTTPS originally. Uh, I didn't redirect. Uh, I didn't prompt to install. I didn't have a service worker. Lots of other stuff, too, I'm sure, if we go down. Um, I didn't have a configure splash screen. And I didn't match my address bar colors. So um, so I created the manifest. I gave it a short name. 
that's solved one of the problems. I just upped my percent by 5% because this is all a game, right? The name is machine learning. The start URL is the page that I want to start. So a cool thing with the start URL, which you can put in your manifest, is that starts at index, right? But for metrics, I can actually say, hey, it came from the home screen. So you can just put a, um, parameters there. And then you have icons for every single um, possible uh, image size you need for the home page. And then you can tell it a background color. So, oh, okay, I'm on, um, we'll see if this works, it probably won't work. Okay, so, yeah. So, it's gonna be quick, but when I click on this, it just says machine learning workshop and it's white. Because, because <laughs> that says machine learning workshop and this is white. Um, but I didn't actually uh, uh, make it work offline, so there's no, uh, there's no caching of anything. I could have added caching, but um, the nice thing, though, is uh, also this phone is four years old, so I don't even know if it has the capabilities. Um, this is my travel phone, except for I haven't gotten the SIM card yet, so it's useless. Um, um, <coughs> Actually, I could go online. So, uh, oh, yeah. The description is an April Fool's joke that Estelle still finds funny um, almost a year later. Um, orientation, portrait, theme color. So the theme color is when you, uh, let's do Twitter. So Twitter is a progressive web app. And it just has Twitter light with the icon. And it tells me I'm off offline. But the top bar is white. On mine, the top bar is going to be blue. Okay, so those are just some features that you can put into your manifest, and you just up your score by 50% or something like that. Um, and then, now I know why. I was messing with it, and I didn't actually use the final version. I'm using the uh, midpoint version, so it didn't actually, that didn't actually have the full manifest on it. So then, in your HTML, you stick link manifest and the manifest JSON file, this being the JSON file, and this is the screenshot uh, when it was working, which was, this is the normal bar, right? But look, it's dark blue, it, like it's, it's a theme. Um, so this usually is uh, gray on my phone. But I said, hey, be blue, and it was. <laughs> okay, so if I reran Lighthouse, this is um, done a while ago, um, I didn't do the rest because I don't need a service worker. Um, I didn't have it run offline. Um, okay, a few other features for progressive web apps, which I didn't tell you, but I was gonna talk about progressive web apps, but here I am talking about progressive web apps. Um, you wanna add all of these for um, Apple, and you wanna add uh, Microsoft uh, rules as well. These are gonna be all online, so I'm not gonna stay on them. Um, Okay. So this is about progressive web apps, and we only said we were going to talk about Lighthouse, and I don't want to talk about progressive web apps. Um, so that's basically it for my talk, except for this one other thing, which is um, uh, California has way better weather than London, so I think you should go to the London conference, but I think you should also go to um, my conference. And uh, let's go to our speakers pages. Um, so, so far we have uh, Jem Young, Paul Irish, Marcy Sutton, that's me, um, Leonie Watson, and uh, we do have other speakers, but um, I don't really know how to do SVGs, and these SVGs were pretty easy, and now it's kind of like, how do you, def like, like Paul Irish, you will never see him not in a blue checkered shirt. Do you guys know who Paul Irish is? Yeah. It's like, if I was going to do Perry, it would just be... Like, if I was to do Perry, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between Perry and Bruce Lawson, except for Bruce Lawson would have a tie and Perry wouldn't. Um, so I have to go to images, but we have, um, uh, we got 175 uh, proposals, and um, I have to still go through them. Uh, but it's a three-day conference preceded by a one-day workshop um, to get you up to speed uh, for people who are not up. You guys don't need to attend the first day. This is 
bringing other people into the, into the um, fold. And it is between, halfway between Silicon Valley and San Francisco, so it's a great reason to go to California. And um, if you don't want to attend, you can always sponsor. Um, <laughs> so here is the, this is the PERMA residence uh, for this talk. And um, uh, oh, also I'm fun employed, so if you know anyone who is hiring a front end manager or a DevRel position where I can travel to the UK and other countries from California, that would be awesome. But I'm not moving from California because um, the weather is literally perfect every single day. <laughs> Any questions? Hello. Oh, and pass these around too. I what? don't want the business cards back, but if these are any of these left over. Just give them to people who ask questions. What? Just give them to people who ask questions. No, I think I have enough. Anyone want this Dan. one? Put them downstairs in the... Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, wait. No, give them to me. I can whip them at people. <laughs> um, in, your s in the speed perception data, 0.89 correlation with the perceptual speed index from time to click. Or up to time to click. That becomes challenging when you don't know the time to click. So time to click is what we're studying the, in the next one. We're at what, at what point are people clicking? But how does that relate to websites where you don't know when they click? Or you don't have someone waiting for it to it's load? It's actually, I mean, it's basically what we're studying in number two. Okay. Because, because that is not a non-existent metric. Yeah. Um, uh. We did time to click based on when they clicked, if you stop it when people click. Right? We're so stopping yeah. we're stopping counting when people have decided that they're ready that but they've made their decision. As an outcome from the study, yep. you can't use that because it doesn't give you a metric that uh, is widely available. We're gonna tr basically we're gonna try to figure out what best correlates with that. So if we had TTFI, time to yeah. first interaction, which Chrome is putting in, yes. then you it might is, be it able is to looking at that. Okay, cool. So yeah. there may be an answer in the future that just yes. kind of pops out of light. Yeah. That's why I need you to, to, to do the, um, I really need I've done it like 20 times. <laughs> do it 20 more. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Have you done the second one 20 times? Yeah. Okay. 25. So you are the, um, one of the three people that has done it? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Because um, not, only, not only do, so on the first one we had uh, the 5,000 sessions, which was way more than we needed. But the second one is studying way more than the first one because we're also doing, um, I have a theory that the older you are, the longer you wait. Because um, I don't know about ages here, but when I watch, what's, what comes after millennial? What's the next generation after millennial? <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. Kid, children. Um, so when I go to conferences and watch children that are like <laughs> moving up the ladder faster than me um, take the test, they, they're just like click right away. And I'm like, huh? Like, it doesn't have the logo yet. Life is uh, short. What? Life is short. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's what we're looking at. Um, and we, ha we have been working with uh, Google in terms of looking at that before it was actually in the browser. Next, Nemo. Really? No call? No. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so you mentioned something briefly about people who take the test is from a banner on the top of web page tests. Yep. So is the population people who use web page tests? The one for the first one was. Okay. That's why it's taking you longer second time around, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, I mean... That was just, people were like, oh, people were really into it. Um, and so, um, you know, it kind of, going viral when you're not popular, to me it went viral. Like to, you know, to people who are a little bit hipper than me, that wasn't really viral. But for performance community, that was kind of viral. 5,000 participants, 5,500 participants, that's viral for our nerdy community. Yeah, that, it yeah. really worked. And are you seeing differences between that, that kind of population and sort of wider, nor I mean certainly my experience is developers like things quite differently on websites from everybody else, yeah. maybe. <laughs> so um, th this, the first study just, just had 20 peers and that was it. The second study actually says, how old are you? What's your gender? What's your, um, 
what you do for a living. I mean, it's not exactly what you do for a living, but what, what industry are you in? Okay. So it's like, are you a student, are you in engineering, or are you um, in some other field? So that we can actually compare and contrast. Because I think there will be a difference. Um, I always use my sister-in-law as an example <laughs> of everything. Um, she lives in Wisconsin, and she doesn't know that she has internet access on her phone. Um, I mean, she does. She uses it, but she doesn't realize that it's internet access. Like, she gets her email. It and just knows. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's kind of like I always measure, like, would she figure this out? I mean, she's not an idiot at all. That's why I use her. Um, but she's not in the tech field. I think she works for, she used to work for a meat distributor and now works for, like, an um, educational administration. Completely not computer related. So good user experience. Can she figure it out? Awesome user experience. Um, so you should always have someone like that in your head when you're developing stuff. Because, you know, if we were developing just for performance for us, uh, it's completely different. Like, we hate those pop-ups. I'm not finding as much hatred of pop-ups in the general population. Anybody? Looking around? Looking around? Right. Okay, I so think, that I said, when I said we hate pop-ups, all engineers are me, and all non-engineers are my sister-in-law. So if I hate something, then all engineers hate something. It's a, it's a sample size of one, but the most important one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, you should know, right? <laughs> yeah, right. What, what does he do? He, uh, he works for our host. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. Anyway, so um, if there are no more questions, just like to um, thank Estelle one more time. So a nice round of applause for Estelle. Great talk.